everybody for coming today and especially uh, Brandon for inviting me. I actually didn't know about Creative Mornings until I got the invite and then when I went to the websites and saw previous talks I was really impressed with the concept and what I love actually is that I don't actually recognize a lot of faces in the room which means I'm speaking to an entirely different audience that probably hasn't heard a lot of the, the points that I'm going to make and that I'm going to talk about and I'm going to try and keep it Somewhat brief, there's a lot for me to say and a lot to cover, but I want to have really good discussion and dialogue afterwards and uh, give you guys opportunity to ask me any questions that you might have about the development process or you know, where, where our heads are at when we're looking at a piece of property and stuff. So I want to have you guys um, feel free to think of what those questions are going to be and, and we'll have a discussion afterwards. So to start off, um, I'm going to talk a bit about like who I am and why I'm here and why I I'm, why I'm chose the route of development. My background is engineering. I'm a structural engineer. I went to the U of A, graduated in 2002. And the reason why I went into engineering is because when I was 16, I grew up on a farm, really loved to, to build things, to create things, to see a finished product. And I decided I really want to build really cool buildings. And I thought, you know, the architects, that's, that's what they do. They really get to shape the, the idea of the building and, and the use of it. So I want to be an architect. But I'm really good at math, and I'm you know, not so sure about going and getting an arts degree. So I'll do a, an engineering degree and then go into architecture. And I had this convoluted idea. Well, after five years of engineering, I was exhausted. And I needed to work for a bit and realized I needed to fully understand the different roles around the table. Because at 16, I didn't understand what I really I want to build really cool buildings. I didn't understand what that meant and how many people are involved in that process. So I worked in the industry as a structural engineer down in Calgary during the big boom and realized from that process that actually the, the architect's role, while they haven't a really important role in the design of the project. They, the, the, the decision of what type of development that's going to be built, the land, the, the selection of the land, all that comes from the developer side. And that was kind of a big black hole. I didn't understand a world that I, I didn't understand. Even though I was at the table and I was being told to design columns for this and beams for that, I didn't really understand all of the work that happened prior to that initial kickoff design meeting and all of the work that the developer had done to get to that point. And so I decided to go switch and work for a developer. And I came, that brought, that's what brought me back here to Edmonton. And I worked for Procure Real Estate Services for a few years and with the ultimate goal that I wasn't seeing a developer, in my mind, doing what I thought was the, the, what development could be and the collaboration it could be. And I knew that there was an opportunity to really focus in on infill and really try to work with communities and create a collaborative process and create some innovation in the industry. So Paul and I, my partner, started chatting one day and realized that our, we, our, our values and our visions aligned very much and there was a great opportunity to start. So when we started off, we're like, great, we have this great idea. There's this niche in the market, this is perfect. We're gonna go out and build really great stuff. And we did not realize, we've been in over a year now into this, and we did not realize how hard that actually is to implement. It's a great idea, it's a great concept, but there are significant challenges that uh, anybody less willful or less determined would literally throw their hands up and go out to the suburbs. And I don't blame any one particular stakeholder at the table or any particular group. It's just, it's been a collection of things that have built up over the years and ideas and directions that are where, the, re the reason why we are where we are today. 
and that's okay. But change has to happen and it's inevitable. So. So, yeah, just like Brandon was saying, I'm really going to focus on the challenges that we've encountered over the last year um, to kind of give you an idea of maybe why, you know, it's a little bit harder to do great development or why it might not be happening at the speed that we expect it to be happening in Infill. And with each of the challenges I'm talking about, I'm going to provide my viewpoint of some of the opportunities there and some of the, the solutions. And then uh, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. So, I mean, when I looked at what urbanism is, it's a, such a huge, broad topic. And while I'm going to focus on, on the challenges piece, I thought it'd be good to really talk about what is urbanism. And it is really broad. It's the way of life of people who interact with their city, how they interact with their built environment, technological advances to improve, improve that life. And so one of the, the biggest challenge that I've encountered in this last year would be culture. It seems like such a simple thing. We all want great development. We all want it to happen. And, and we talk about how it's, it should be possible. But there's a culture in the city that's comfortable with the old way of doing things. And we really need to break through that um, by showing you know, how we can build really good buildings and, and still make money at the end of the day, but come out with a better product. So even though there's that strong appetite, yeah, when rubber hits the road, yeah, people just want to continue business as usual. And so we've come up with some you know, great plans over this last year, and, and we're going out trying to get designs built, get floor plans made, you know, get permits assembled. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, the responses we get back are, that's impossible. You can't do that. Do you honestly expect to build that this year? Do you honestly expect there to be a market for that? And you know, while I appreciate um, people's viewpoints and stuff, it does get really tiresome as somebody who's out trying to do innovative things to hear that every single day. <laughs> um, you hear it 95% of the time. And there's, of course, those people that are excited. You tell them about the project and they're like, great, I can't wait for that thing to be built. But in the industry itself, what I'm surprisingly coming up against is some of that negativity. And how does this impact good design? Well, the can't do attitude really kills that innovation. It really kills that spirit. We need to be questioning why things are done a certain way and always be looking for that better way, not just accepting the status quo and say, well, that's just how it's always been done. That's not an answer, that's an excuse. So with this challenge comes opportunities. So in this last year, we started IDEA, the Infill Development and Edmonton Association, to do exactly that, talk about culture change, talk about it out in the industry, talk about it on the city side, talk about it with community, and talk about what um, that really means for a city and where we want to go. And the idea is to create a network of industry and community leaders that really believe in that culture change and are out there promoting it and talking about it and uh, and implementing it. And we're only going to do that by the collaboration, the discussion, and talking about the bigger picture and why this culture change is needed. And education, education of the general public on why we need to start doing things differently is something that I see IDEA really being able to, to focus on. And just another thing I wanted to add was um, we need to ensure that the bigger picture or the vision of the project is top of mind. And that's something as developers that we can really improve upon, not just selling a unit or talking about an apartment and 
you know, the great rent and everything, but really talking back to the core reason why we chose to build an apartment in this area, why we chose this type of a floor plan. Um, and we need to explain that to everybody who touches the project. So for example, uh, we're talking with transportation and they're telling me that my project increases traffic to the area and negatively impacts the infrastructure. So basically it's a nuisance to the system. <laughs> And my response back is, well, this is a great transit-oriented development, revitalizing a mature neighborhood. It's going to bring people back to the core. It's got some family units. It's going to bring children back to the, the schools that are starting to empty. So, you know, when I start talking about it that way, they see it entirely different. The project's no longer a nuisance. It's helping build a better city and create a better community. And one of the big things that um, I think makes something Edmonton uh, is really doing is they're really touching into that culture change. What are you building and how can I help? The next challenge is fear. And I'll be quite blunt about that one. <laughs> I speak to people about infill development and their thoughts or feelings on the subject. And I see a lot of fear creep into the conversation. The communities have a fear of change. The developers are afraid that if they speak too loudly against regulations that they'll be punished the next time they go for permitting, or they'll be labeled as difficult. Um, city administrators are afraid to make decisions and to take risks because they, they figure that their job is on the line or that they'll get reprimanded. And I actually see fear on the political side as well. There's fear in, you know, future votes, there's fear in losing campaign dollars if you vote a certain way or you make certain decisions at, at city council. And how this impacts good design is when f decisions are made out of fear, they're usually the wrong decisions. You're no longer thinking about what is best for the community, the outcome of the project or the greater good. You're shifting into the self-preservation and your viewpoint narrows. So opportunities get lost in the design suffers. Just a graphic. <laughs> so what can we do about it? And this also speaks a bit to the culture change. We accept that with innovation comes mistakes. We will make mistakes and that's okay. We need to create a culture of accepting that and actually rewarding it to people who at least are trying. Um, something a little bit more specifically to the city and, and the fear with city administration is we need to give our development officers at the city the tools and resources they need to make decisions in a timely manner. They should be able to support those decisions with sufficient information and back them up and feel really comfortable that they've made the right decision going forward. What tends to happen is that fear creeps in and they just throw it to SDAB, the Subdivision and Development Appeal Board. I don't want to make the decision, so I'll push it to the next guy. And you see that happening a lot. We also need to create um, city project teams that are comprised of members from each department who will meet with the developers and their project teams, especially on more complex projects, to discuss variances or concerns, uh, questions, kind of in that one initial meeting. What we've been finding is your project goes in for permit and then it goes into the big system and it starts making the rounds and each individual department looks at their individual piece. But nobody really sits down and looks at the global view of the project and how one department's demands or criteria of what you need to meet negatively impact another. So we had a situation where, you know, garbage enclosures, the way it had to be orientated, they didn't want to go in reverse, all these, all this criteria, and we explained to them how much this was impacting parking. Parking is a huge issue in mature neighborhoods. Communities do not want you going for parking variances. And so we were trying really hard to avoid that. And it would have been simple if we could have gotten everybody into the same room to talk about kind of this global idea of what we're trying to achieve and how one side is counteracting the other and how we can come up with a solution all together that everybody's happy with in that room before we leave that meeting. 
but because that meeting can happen or won't happen, we're, we're meeting as a developer individually with each department, going back to the other department, going back and forth, and time gets wasted. And I've heard the argument that you know, having to have project meetings with every single project or developer that comes along is too onerous, it's too time consuming. But I've seen how much time goes into the back and forth, back and forth. And trust me, a one or two hour meeting at the very beginning with everybody around the table would save a lot of time, a lot of headache, and, uh, and go a long way. The other uh, opportunity here is the city is focusing a lot lately on open government, and that's something that cities all across the world are really looking hard at. And I think the idea of open government can really come into the development world. Um, something as simple as posting information online regarding the current ap permit approval process and the length of time that it's currently taking helps the developer and the design team think ahead in the schedule. But right now, it's a, it's a it's a big guess, it's a big unknown. So every time you go in there, you have no idea what to expect. And time is everything, schedule is everything on these projects. We have tight construction timelines. We're always trying to figure out how to avoid heating and hoarding and, and constructing foundations in the middle of winter. So something as, as simple as posting those times on a website where you can go and plan ahead and think, okay, it's three months or it's three weeks or whatever that, because it, it changes, it constantly changes depending on the flux of projects moving in and out of the city. Um, also showing where you are in the queue. So you have an idea of how long you're gonna have to wait before somebody's looking at, at your file. Um, something I'm gonna speak about too, which is probably a little bit controversial, but I'm gonna speak to it anyways tiered grading of developers. It doesn't happen, but it happens. So nobody wants to talk about it formally, but we know as developers that it is happening. Files get pushed ahead of others. Developers have what I've been informed actually, um, a class A, a class B, or a class C grading. So if you're a class A developer, you're likely one of the bigger guys that you're dealing with the city all the time and you have those relationships within the city, which is great, and your projects um, get looked at um, in a little bit more timely fashion, but you also, perhaps, in terms of um, putting money up for municipal improvement agreements or letters of credit, they look at, you don't need quite as much uh, in terms of um, the, le the, the letter of credit just because they know that you're a reputable developer, they've worked with you, you know the system, and, and it's all good and they can trust you. And the way it was explained to me was smaller developers, mostly infill developers, are a pain in the butt. They're smaller, they have less resources, they don't know the system, they tend to make mistakes, and they actually don't have an opportunity to get that higher grading. So they're already kind of at a disadvantage. And it is the truth. Smaller infill developers are smaller. They have less resources. They are making mistakes. And how do, like, I don't think that it's a problem that there's a tiered structure happening. I actually think it's a great idea. It's a great incentive to tell developers you can achieve faster turnaround times, you can achieve lower uh, letters of credit if you meet these guidelines. If you behave in a certain way and you build really great developments, we're gonna reward you by helping tie up less money up front and save you time in terms of the approval process. So I think there's an, actually a great opportunity there that needs to be capitalized on. Because right now, if you talk to anybody at the city in a public setting, it's not happening. So. The next challenge we're gonna talk about is financing, because I think that's something that actually also doesn't get talked about a lot. Um, for most developers, they're not financing projects with cash in the bank. They're funding these projects through lenders and leveraging uh, the investment dollars. So the biggest challenge that they encounter is the fundamental difference between our industries. So development industry is, is accepting and used to risk 
and lenders are typically quite risk adverse. So especially with larger Canadian institutions after a major recession, which is a good thing. I don't want banks lending money to anybody and everybody. But it does create a pinch point in terms of the upfront financing of the project, which can affect design and quality of the project. Cash flow on a project can make or break that project. So you can have the greatest design with the greatest intentions, but if you can't fund it, nothing's gonna get built. It's, it just is an idea that doesn't exist. So I'm gonna speak a bit to an example on an apartment building that we're building. We're trying to do, be really innovative and go with modular, which is great. Everybody's excited about it. It's, you know, it's gonna revolutionize the, the industry here in Edmonton. And it's revol revolutionizing the industry across the world. So there's a lot of excitement happening about modular right now and the efficiencies of it. And I mean, I could go on and on about how great I think modular is. But from a lending perspective, it's a completely different beast. So when you're going out to the lenders, you automatically get turned away from the, the typical guys because this is a model that they don't necessarily understand. It's different than stick built. It's different than built on site. Um, there, you know, there's concerns while well, you're putting all your eggs in one supplier's basket. They have a factory somewhere, and all the modules are there. And what if this worst case scenario happened? What if that worst case scenario and stuff? And it is very different, and there is different levels of risk to it, but they are manageable, and you need to find lenders that are willing to work through those um, differences and, and, and figure out solutions to all these problems. But because there's so much demand for, for funding, you get turned away because, I mean, they'll just go to the next easier deal, because it's a headache. It's a headache to figure out how to innovate and do things differently. So we did find a lender, and you know we're negotiating with them and, and figuring out the deal. We've given up our first, firstborn children, you know, signed away our lives, our mortgages, our houses, everything that we possibly own. And then the next hurdle gets hit. We've you know gone out to the market and gotten appraisals done on on the drawings and the type of building it's going to be and the level of finishes and and we got a number back, and it's great. From our perspective, we're happy. You know, it's exactly in line with where we thought it was gonna be. Financer comes back and says, no. We don't believe that that product is gonna be worth that much in a year's time. We're gonna be very conservative and value it at, you know, somewhere between 60 to 70% of that value, which directly correlates to how much money they're gonna loan you. So now, where you had a great design with great finishes, you've lost the ability to borrow money that's gonna to take to build that thing. And so that, that to me is probably one of the biggest disconnects happening right now is how do you build a really innovative product with great value and not get valued at the same level as a project down the street that was built 10 years ago with linoleum and you know crappy building envelope and, and all these things. And, I mean, there's no way to really um, escape that, except, you know, we fought pretty hard on this one. We managed to, to scrape a little bit more, a little bit more, and then we had to go back and value engineer. We had to go back to the design team and say, look, we cannot, you know, the lending is really tight right now. We cannot get the funds we need to build, you know, the higher quality that we were looking at. And luckily on this project, we had a team that really believed so strongly in it. They were like, we will find a way. We'll make it happen. And, and that to me is, is everything. The people you have around the table that believe in that project, that's what's going to push that idea over the goal line. Sorry, I'm behind on my slides. <laughs> so in terms of lending, there isn't a lot of opportunity short of looking for more innovative um, models out there for, for lending money, and we are doing that. And there is some stuff, interesting stuff happening down in the States because of the whole recession and everything that happened down there. So we're doing some research, and it's going to take time because there's a lot of legalities in terms of um, financing models and, and dealing with investors' funds and, and how 
all that works, but uh, we are working on that. I think that's, you know, that's a, a lengthy process, but um, otherwise we are, we are stuck with the current system and the current model, because if you want to, you can go elsewhere to borrow money, but then you're, you're getting much higher percentage points and that affects the bottom line and affects the quality of the project. So the next challenge, <laughs> we are not Calgary. We're not Vancouver, we're not Seattle, we're not Portland. I'm as guilty as anybody is talking about how wouldn't it be great if we were like those cities or look at that street in that city and how do we get that here? And, and I think that's good. I think we, we need to do that. But we need to figure out what's the best that we can be as a city. We're not, we're not going to replicate other cities. We're not going to become other cities. We're going to be Edmonton. We are Edmonton. Accept it. Like that is, we're, we're here and there's fantastic things about Edmonton and there's definitely ways we can improve it. So what is, what is the best city that we can make Edmonton? And, and stop constantly feeling like we're comparing ourselves to other greater, bigger cities. Those comparisons are necessary and I'll speak to that in a minute, but um, so yeah, when, how this affects good design is when we're always looking at other cities and wishing that we were built like them, we lose sight of finding our own identity and an a innovative built form that is uniquely ours. So what can we do about it? Well, we do go to those other cities and we look at what they've done. They are 10 years ahead of us, 20 years ahead of us in terms of infill development. And sure, you can see that as a bad thing, but I actually see that as an opportunity. They've gone ahead and they've done these things, they've made mistakes, they've learned from those mistakes, and we can go learn from them. And by doing that, we'll save ourselves from learning mistakes, take those ideas back here, but then really study how to turn them into an Edmonton solution. Because not every design down in California or down in you know, Seattle is going to work here. But we can take their best ideas, bring them home, and really turn them into a unique Edmonton product. Um, so it saves us from making these costly mistakes ourselves. And, um, and we have an opportunity, and I've talked with a few different communities. There's communities that want innovative built product in their, in their neighborhoods, and they've offered, like, come experiment in our neighborhood. We want to be pilot projects. And I think there's a big opportunity, and I have spoken with the city of Edmonton around this, in terms of really trying to push the envelope in concentrated areas, study how that affects the neighborhood, and then learn from that, and then blow it up on a bigger scale. We also need to connect the dots for Edmontonians regarding the city that they say they want to live in and the choices that they're making today um, that either add or detract from that city that they want. Are they walking the talk? Are they wishing for a Seattle or Vancouver style city while they live in the suburbs? Next one is, of course, zoning bylaws and regulations. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, it's an obvious thing to talk about for a lot of developers and, and I could not talk about it. I'm not going to talk about it for very long because I, I could do a whole talk on that specific one. But, um, but I am constantly hearing that as a city we want to densify our mature neighborhoods. We want to build a more sustainable city. Yet the zoning bylaws combined with the mature neighborhood overlay are actually stating the exact opposite. Right now we are allowed to build more height more density out in the newer neighborhoods than we can in our mature neighborhoods. So this impacts good design. Um, sorry. This impacts good design because we get exactly what we're asking for. If our bylaws state that just in the pure regulations, that's exactly what we're going to get. We're going to get more density out in the suburbs than we are in the mature neighborhoods and we're not gonna get it at the growth rate that we want infill to happen. So what do we do about it? Well, there's been layers and layers of regulations and bylaws working their way into the existing uh, zoning regulations. And in my view, it's time to simplify. 
it's time to evaluate every single regulation we've got. Where did it come from? Why is it there? Right now, we're just accepting it as is. That's the way it's always been. It's always been there. Now we're going to talk about changing it by a couple inches or changing things by a meter or something. But let's start actually taking steps backwards. Why does this zoning bylaw even exist? And start having those conversations. And we need to develop a new system that aligns us in the city that we want to see 50 years from now. Because right now, in its current form, it just doesn't do that. And right now, the current regulations are very black and white, especially when it comes to height. And I see an opportunity to provide more flexibility in the current process so that fewer projects are being pushed to SDAB. So you want more height. Well, now, if you provide a sun study and you provide a little bit more information that allows the development officer to make an informed decision of whether or not that additional height is really impacting their neighbor, now you've changed the conversation. It's not just you either meet this height or you don't. Allow somebody to make a case for how that height makes the project better and how it doesn't negatively impact the community. But right now, because that information isn't requested, I see a lot of blanket statements like, six inches higher than the regulations is going to negatively impact my access to sunlight. But we don't really know how much it's going to impact the access to sunlight. And we have enough information now with Google Maps and, and images to figure that out. So let's talk about Let's talk about the information. Let's talk about the details. And let's really talk about the, the positive and negative impacts of infill. So this is a quote I found on Facebook the other day, which was actually perfect for this conversation. Never, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And that, I won't say anything more. So in summary, this is just a few of the points that I made talking about the different challenges and ways to turn them into opportunities. Um, the biggest one was culture change. I can't stress that enough. Um, accepting mistakes as inevitable and rewarding innovation rather than um, shying away from it. The creative financing models, which I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, and red brick, we, we are looking into it. Um, studying innovation in other cities and bringing back, um, bringing them home but turning them into an Edmonton based solution. And overhaul of the zoning bylaws and mature neighborhood overlay. So on that note, <laughs> I will leave it up to the floor. So thank you very much.